uh, in the United States, we've had terrible problems with the fallacy of measurement yes. because we want to spend very little money on evaluation. And so we came up with the no child left behind test, which is a multiple choice test, which then causes teachers to neglect history, neglect critical thinking, neglect the quality of writing, because what they do in the classroom is driven by the system of measurement that's actually being used. So meanwhile, much more deep thinkers about education are trying to think first about the goals and then come up with techniques of measurement. And there are plenty of people who are working on how you would actually measure critical thinking, the development of imagination, and the knowledge of uh, the world that's necessary to make important political decisions. But uh, you have to consult those experts and, and try to really work on that. You know, what it means is the democracy has already made progress. Because if democracy really has a public debate, about what goals it's really striving for, well, that's already a huge amount of progress beyond where we currently are. Uh, and, and so then, of course, the process of evaluation would be part of that public debate, and it would help us implement the goals that we've already decided on. So that, that would be a good way of doing things. I think the bad way, which is much more common in the world today, is to just uh, let the uh, test scores uh, drive policy without actually thinking about what a democracy should be trying to achieve. Well, okay, I think there are three things. First is just the needs of business and industry. Countries that are single-mindedly focused on that, such as China, and Singapore have still recognized the huge importance of the humanities and have increased their spending on humanities precisely because we are a mobile economy and we can't get by with skills that are learned by rote. People need to be imaginative, they need to be mobile, and they need to be capable of thinking critically so that corruption in the workplace is uh, reported and unmasked and so forth. The second I would make is we can't ignore the needs of democratic citizenship. Democracies do not survive if people make up their decisions entirely by authority and peer pressure. So a good system of education should train people not just to follow a narrow professional specialization, but also to be good citizens who can deliberate okay. well. Uh, now, of course, this is much easier in a liberal arts system, which we have in the United States, where students might let's say, have computer science as their major yes. subject, but they all do certain common courses in the humanities. And I would recommend that system. The Netherlands is uh, moving very strongly in the direction of that system. South Korea has that system already. Scotland has that system. And I think it's a much better way of integrating the humanities so that students all come together in certain common courses. But anyway, then the third point I would make is a point about life. Uh, people are being prepared now for a very long life in which they need to think about death, they need to think about care for their aging parents, they need to think about all kinds of issues that the humanities make central. My particular view involves the idea that any decent society has to focus on certain central capabilities and guarantee those to all citizens up to a threshold level. A society that just focuses on growth might not give people as adequate access to health care or to education or to political liberty and religious liberty. We can see that in the case of many countries in the current world. So we want to spell out what are our goals, what are the things that we think are part of a minimal account of social justice, and then think of the task of a just society as providing those. So this is really what constitutional law is all about, is about spelling out fundamental entitlements and then thinking about how to implement that. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Nussbaum.